in light of those calls and releases the First Presidency has just announced, may I speak for all of us in saying we will remember and love always those who have served so faithfully with us, just as we immediately love and welcome those who now come into office. Our heartfelt thanks to every one of you. I wish to speak of the Savior's parable in which a householder went out early in the morning to hire laborers. After employing the first group at 6 in the morning, he returned at 9 a.m., at 12 noon, and at 3 in the afternoon, hiring more workers as the urgency of the harvest increased. The Scripture says he came back a final time about the 11th hour, approximately 5 p.m., and hired a concluding number then. Then just an hour later, all the workers gathered to receive their day's wage. Surprisingly, all received the same wage in spite of the different hours of labor. Immediately, those hired first were angry, saying, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day? When reading this parable, perhaps you, as well as those workers, have felt there was an injustice being done here. Let me speak briefly to that concern. First of all, it is important to note that no one has been treated unfairly here. The first workers agreed to the full wage of the day, and they received it. Furthermore, they were, I can only imagine, very grateful to get the work. In the time of the Savior, an average man and his family could not do much more than live on what they made that day. If you didn't work or farm or fish or sell, you likely didn't eat. With more prospective workers than jobs, these first men chosen were the most fortunate in the entire labor pool that morning. Indeed, if there's any sympathy to be generated, it should at least initially be for the men not chosen, who also had mouths to feed and backs to clothe. Luck never seemed to be with some of them. With each visit of the steward throughout the day, they always saw someone else chosen. But just at day's close, the householder returns a surprising fifth time with a remarkable eleventh-hour offer. These last and most discouraged of laborers, hearing only that they will be treated fairly, accept work without even knowing the wage, knowing that anything will be better than nothing, which is what they've had so far. Then, as they gather for their payment, they are stunned to receive the same as all the others. How awestruck they must have been, and how very, very grateful. Surely never had such compassion been seen in all their working days. It is against that reading of the story that I feel the grumbling of the first laborers must be seen. As the householder in the parable tells them, and I paraphrase really only slightly, my friends, I'm not being unfair to you. You agreed on the wage for the day, a good wage. You were very happy to get the work, and I'm very happy with the way you served. You're paid in full. Take your pay and enjoy the blessing. As for the others, surely I am free to do what I like with my own money. Then this piercing question to anyone then or now who may need to hear it, why should you be jealous because I choose to be kind? Brothers and sisters, there are going to be times in our lives when someone else gets an unexpected blessing 
or receives some special recognition. May I plead with us not to be hurt and certainly not to feel envious when good fortune comes to another person. We are not diminished when someone else is added upon. We're not in a race against each other to see who's the wealthiest or the most talented or the most beautiful or even the most blessed. The race we are really in is the race against sin, and surely envy is one of the most universal of those. Furthermore, envy is a mistake that just keeps on giving. Obviously, we suffer a little when some misfortune befalls us, but envy requires us to suffer all good fortune that befalls everyone we know. What a bright prospect that is. <laughs> Downing another quart of pickle juice every time anyone around you has a happy moment. <laughs> to say nothing of the chagrin in the end when we find that God really is both just and merciful, giving to all who stand with Him all that he hath, as the Scripture says. So lesson number one from the Lord's Vineyard, coveting, pouting, or tearing others down does not elevate your standing, nor does demeaning someone else improve your self-image. So be kind and be grateful that God is kind. It is a happy way to live. A second point I wish to take from this parable is the sorrowful mistake some could make if they were to forego the receipt of their wages at the end of the day because they were preoccupied with perceived problems earlier in the day. It doesn't say here that anyone threw his coin in the householder's face and stormed off penniless, but I suppose one might have. My beloved brothers and sisters, what happened in this story at nine or noon or three is swept up in the grandeur of the universally generous payment at the end of the day. The formula of faith is to hold on, work on, see it through, and let the distress of earlier hours, real or imagined, fall away in the abundance of the final reward. Don't dwell on old issues and grievances, not toward yourself, nor your neighbor, nor even, I might add, toward this true and living church. The majesty of your life, of your neighbor's life, and of the gospel of Jesus Christ will be made manifest at the last day, even if such majesty is not always recognized by everyone in the early going. So don't hyperventilate about something that happened at 9 o'clock in the morning when the grace of God is trying to reward you at 6 in the evening, whatever your labor arrangements have been through the day. We consume such precious emotional and spiritual capital, clinging tenaciously to the memory of a discordant note we struck in a childhood piano recital, or something a spouse said or did 20 years ago that we're determined to hold over his or her head for another 20, <laughs> or an incident in church history that proved no more or less than that mortals will always struggle to measure up to the immortal hopes placed before them. Even if one of those grievances did not originate with you, it can end with you. And what a reward there will be for that contribution when the Lord of the vineyard looks you in the eye and accounts are settled at the end of our earthly day, which 
leads me to my third and last point. This parable, like all parables, is not really about laborers or wages any more than the others are about sheep and goats. This is a story about God's goodness, His patience and forgiveness, and the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a story about generosity and compassion. It is a story about grace. It underscores the thought I heard many years ago that surely the thing God enjoys most about being God is the thrill of being merciful, especially to those who don't expect it and especially feel they don't deserve it. I do not know who in this vast audience today may need to hear the message of forgiveness inherent in this parable. But however late you think you are, however many chances you think you've missed, however many mistakes you feel you've made, or talents you think you don't have, or distance from home and family and God you feel you have traveled, I testify that you have not traveled beyond the reach of divine love. It is not possible for you to sink lower than the infinite light of Christ's atonement shines. Whether you are not yet of our faith or were once with us and have not remained, there is nothing in either case you have done that cannot be undone. There is no problem which you cannot overcome. There is no dream that in the unfolding of time and eternity cannot yet be realized. Even if you feel you are the lost and last laborer of the eleventh hour, the Lord of the vineyard still stands beckoning. Come boldly to the throne of grace and fall at the feet of the Holy One of Israel. Come and feast without money and without price at the table of the Lord. I especially make an appeal for husbands and fathers, priesthood bearers or prospective priesthood bearers, to, as Lehi said, awake and arise from the dust and be men. Not always, but often. It is the men who choose not to, to answer the call to come join the ranks. Women and children frequently seem more willing. Brethren, step up. Do it for your sake. Do it for the sake of those who love you and are praying that you will respond. Do it for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ who paid an unfathomable price for the future he wants you to have. My beloved brothers and sisters, to those of you who have been blessed by the gospel for many years because you were fortunate enough to find it early, and to those of you who have come to the gospel by stages and phases later, and finally to those of you member or not yet member, who may still be hanging back, to each of you, one and all, I testify of the renewing power of God's love and the miracle of His grace. His concern is for the faith at which you finally arrive, not the hour of the day in which you got there. So if you've made covenants, keep them. If you haven't made them, make them. If you've made them and broken them, repent and repair them. It is never too late, so long as the master of the vineyard says there is time. Please listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit telling you right now, this very moment that you should accept 
the atoning gift of the Lord Jesus Christ and enjoy the fellowship of His labor. Don't delay. It's getting late. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.